Hi, I'm Charlie Wharton, chaplain with the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office. And I'm Chaplain Larry Crabtree with the St. Mary's County Sheriff's Office and the Maryland State Police. Larry, if there is one thing that is probably closer to our heart, it is this function that chaplains really need to be aware of, and that's death notifications. This is something you and I talk a lot about because it is something that makes an impact on people's lives. And I think it is an ability and a talent that is being lost in today's, in today's world. Let's talk about death notifications. Sounds great. Yeah, Charlie, death notifications are probably considered by a law enforcement officer the least desirable job that they have, for good reason. Um, it is a difficult thing to do. Uh, you, you fear it because you know you are taking someone the worst news that you could take. I, I can't think of any news that's worse than to tell someone they've just lost a loved one. Um, and that is a, an intrepidating place to be in, to have that responsibility to communicate that information. And while law enforcement recognizes how much they dislike doing that, sadly, it's also the one, I believe, in which they are the least trained to do. Um, and here's what's so important. We've been talking in this series about the softer side of law enforcement. These are a skills that take some finesse. And delivering a death notification is at the top of the list of finesse, of doing it right. And it's because when a death notification is done well, that will have lasting impact forever in a person's life. But you know the reverse is also true. When a death notification is done improperly, it will also leave scarring and impacting impacts on a person's life forever. They will never forget it. So it can either be the process, the beginning of the process of healing, or really just opening up that wound one more, one more layer. And it's, it's a wound that will stay. The conversations I've heard with people afterwards, they will remember things that just blow your mind. They know what shoes I was wearing. They can tell me where a scuff mark was on that shoe. Uh, they will know if there was a spot on my shirt. These are things that are just etched into people's minds that they never forget. That's how intense that situation is. Can I share something? I was at a football game one time, and I was just standing there doing, doing crowd control at the football game. And I had a guy come up to me and he said, I hate seeing you. And this was pre-issues that we're, we're having today. And it took me by surprise a little bit. And then he followed up. He said, because you were there when I found out my wife died. Mm. Out of these hundreds of people that were was at a football game, he could pick me out of that crowd. So what we're talking about is something that's very important. And understandably, it's difficult to do. And it's why law enforcement don't like doing it. But uh, maybe we can share some helpful information so that we can do it better. So what's at the top of your list? Well. Perhaps the best way, a formula to keep in mind when doing a death notification, we could say it like this. Death notifications should always be done in person, in pairs, in plain language, and with deep compassion. You gave us a formula that is very valuable in being able to do death notifications. And it starts off by talking about being in person. What do you mean by that? Yeah, now this is really important. What I mean by that is death notifications must, and I'm going to use the word must, they must be done face to face with you looking in their eyes in their very presence. One of the major taboos of death notifications is that they should never be done by telephone unless there's some bizarre reason you have no other option. But it is a horrible way to do a death notification. In fact, it's a dangerous way, and really it's a demonstration of intellectual laziness. You don't know who it is you're talking to on the other side of that line. Remember, they could have a very serious heart condition, and you're not aware of it. That person that you're about to tell that information to, they might very well be suicidal and already at the end of the rope. And now you've just pushed them over the edge. It also could be, let's say, a mother that's eight and a half months pregnant. 
that just lost her partner. So we don't know what's happening after that's made, and that person could be in absolute jeopardy, and no one knows. So we have to be really careful about the telephone. We have to do everything we can to do that face-to-face and make this very personal. Let's flip this around too. How many prank calls do people get today? Oh. Or not just prank calls, but just absolute uh, calls that they want to get back for, at somebody. So they'll, they'll deliver some horrific news. Being there in uniform, or at least in some semblance of uniform, adds some credibility to it. Absolutely, very good point, Charlie. Excellent observation. So first of all, in person, now let's talk about the second one. What do you mean by in pairs? Death notifications always need to be done in teams. There should be two, not just one person. Remember, you gotta take care of people. It's not just delivering bad news. People respond in ways that will blow your mind. Everybody's different. I have had experiences where they literally have projectile vomited out of, out of just sheer emotion. Others drop out and need medical attention. We don't know that they have a heart attack. Uh, is it just emotion that needs to be addressed and cared for? So with two people there, that's very helpful because these are the things that happen. Some get very angry. My very first death notification I ever did, I was punched in the face. <laughs> and I'm wondering, why did I ever say I want to be a chaplain? Yeah, it's only funny because it happened to you, not me. Uh, yeah, but I will never forget it. It was a young gal, so it didn't hurt too much, <laughs> but I got it. And that was the response, not appropriately, but that's how it happened. So it was good to have a police officer with me. <laughs> so. so in person, in pairs, what do you mean by in plain language? In plain language is we cannot use euphemisms. This, this information, this news is so critically important, it is so heavy that we must be very clear in what we're speaking. And you use words like died, were killed, that's not euphemisms, that's clear. They're in shock, and so it has to be put out very simply. And so a good formula I'll use is first, you have to make sure, first of all, you're communicating with the right people. So if you have someone that was, had just died in some tragic way, you're gonna have to verify, is this truly their relative? Am I talking to the right people? That's number one. And once that's established, is then I pretty much try to invite ourselves into the house. And, and, and you need to take a, a little bit of, of loving control of the situation, asking for everyone in the house to get together, even if it's in the middle of the night, who are adults, that can communicate, have them seated and sit down. Um, and I like to get down on their level with them and get close and, and look at them and say, I have some very tragic news to share with you. Your son, your father, your brother, so-and-so, was killed this evening in a car accident. And I stopped. And you need to let them process that because that was plain language. And that's where they need some time to respond right now. And you're there to be that support and that care and you just need to listen and respond. So that's the plain language part. I think there's a, maybe a, a misnomer out there that in some way we can, we can soften the news by softening our words. I don't know that that's possible. We, we can't soften the word. It's, it's not the words that are soft, it's your demeanor. And so that's why I do like, I do like to get them seated because they already know it's something really bad's coming. They're already, but they need to hear it. They really, they have to hear it. They want to hear it because they already know something terrible has just occurred. And so that's where you sit them down. And of course, they're, and then they're, I'll often hear them say, what, what is it, what is it, what is it? I, I'm gonna share this in just a minute because we all get seated. And we don't want to delay that, but we need to get them where they're safe and then to communicate that information clearly and, and connect with them because they're going to ask some questions after they, whatever. Some people have no response. Can I get you some tea? And you're, you're wondering, did you hear what I just said? Yes. But that's the way people respond. They're, in, in essence, a form of shock right then. But you just, no, no thank you, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. How can I help you? Can you talk a little bit about the different, there are basically two types of death notifications. One is where you're actually um, aware of the circumstances. You know, you were out at the, the crash scene and you see it. The other type is where you get information from maybe another agency and you have to pass it on. What suggestions do you have about the differences between those two? Well, well the first is, I, 
please get as much information as you can from that other agency before you go because they're going to ask basic questions. They all do. And so that's get as much as you can. And by the way, the reason I say in pairs, and remember, I'm a chaplain. So I am not a police officer. I'm not an investigator. I'm, I'm a chaplain. And I'm equipped with training and death notifications. And I'm also equipped with the emotional ability to absorb some of these things. The police officer is often there to answer questions. They deal with the facts and the information and also to listen. Uh, one of the things you have to keep in mind is sometimes death notifications involve homicides and chaplains are not trained investigators and so things could be said in that dialogue that might be very pertinent to the case but I'm not trained to pick up. Maybe they're talking about where someone was a few hours before and I would not recognize how important that was to the case when a trained investigator, that could be a whole different move and direction of that investigation that's required. So it's important to make sure you have in that team the people pertinent in that bubble that need to be there and recognizing those needs. Do you have to tell everything that you know? No, because it's not, it's not pertinent to go into every graphic detail. One of the questions I'm almost always asked is, did they suffer? That's a, a given. And if I don't know, that's the answer. I, I don't know. Um, or sometimes it's pretty obvious. It doesn't look like they did. Let's go to the fourth aspect of it, and that is in compassion. Why is that so important? Well, again, we've been talking through this series of understanding how people feel and having empathy, being able to share in that that emotion and that experience. Well, I know that information that I'm bringing is the worst information a person could hear, and I know that's deeply hurting them. And so with compassion, I'm able to engage in them and express, I know you're hurting. In fact, I hurt that you're hurting, and I hurt that I'm the one that even told you this. Because you're important to me, and I want to help you. And that's what I'm trying to communicate that whole time. So once that information is given, my death notification isn't done. My death notification, that, that, now next process is to make sure that they're safe and well. Uh, make sure that I can do anything I can to help them. Can I help you call family? Because you need to get some support system there to be with them now in those hours in this difficult time. Is there, is there a clergy member that I can contact for you that could be a support and that can intervene for you? So this is my next round. That's what any, a, a police officer should be doing the same thing, is to make sure they're okay and do what they can in those moments to assist them when they're hurting, to get support that's there, and to, to make sure they're okay through this process. That's what is entailed in a, a death notification. And it's a lengthy process. It's not short. I think one of the, the, the struggles, sometimes especially in a busy agency, is Let's get in, let's get it done, and let's get out of there so we can get on to something else. And that's really a formula for, for failure. It is. Because again, this, this is a police officer serving the community, and we need to show them that compassion, that we understand their grief, that we're sorry and hurting for them, and then we need to make sure they have the support there to undergird and help them in these next hours and days. A very important soft skill that people hate, but makes a lasting impression. It does. And, it, and believe it or not, it has great reward to it. Well, that sums up this section and this series. I've enjoyed it. I have. I, I think this is like, I mean, this is where rubber meets the road stuff. This is good stuff. It's always a great opportunity and privilege for us to be invited into your patrol car, into your office, into your homes, and we appreciate the support that we get for this. Well. As we sign off today, remember, be strong and be safe.